Michael Killen. Hi, I'm Michael Killen, and I made this painting. It's my latest painting, and I want to share why I made the painting. And then I'm going to invite some scientists and some experts to come on and help me decode the painting and share some additional information. I'm one of those persons who has this feeling that maybe there just might be more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and in the oceans than is safe for us. And so I decided to make a painting to help us appreciate how powerful, how big that greenhouse gas monster is. And since right now we are about to elect the next president of the United States, I thought it might be a good idea to make a painting that suggested to the next president, the next Congress, what some good strategies, some good solutions for dealing with this big monster and at the same time meeting the energy requirements of the nation. So, this is the result of that work. And I make the paintings, all the paintings that I make, uh, primarily for one reason, and that is the, the economists, the scientists, the political leaders, the leaders of corporations are all struggling to share the message with you that this monster is something that we all need to take seriously and we all need to work to find solutions to meet our energy needs and at the same time not feed this monster anymore. So I want to start by inviting the author of one of the most important books that helps me think clearly about energy and people who are really into the global issues of energy uh, all study. It's a cubic mile of oil and it's by Rapu. Rapu. Come on up. Rapu, thank you. Hi, thank Michael. you for, for coming on. And let me get over here. And first of all, you're an SRI fellow. You know, you know they, that's a nice Thanks. distinction. Sure. And you've studied the size, the shape, the trends of the, what I call the greenhouse gas monster. And by the way, I, I know you're a scientist and all of that. Do you get offended that I, I call this a monster? No. Okay. You are an artist. You are at liberty to do that. Absolutely. And I'm not offended. Okay. And by the way, I put a fan on its face because what this monster is doing, is in effect, it's sucking in all the pollution, all the fumes from uh, the burning of coal gas and oil, and it's getting larger and larger. How big is this monster? So right now, globally, we are feeding this monster about 36 billion tons of CO2 every year, OK? Just from the use of the fossil fuels. 36 billion tons, tons. a year. And that is for the United States? Or no, is that that's for the world, 7 billion people for the world. So per person, yeah. it's about 4.5 tons of CO2 per person, roughly. Averaged out around the world? Average out around the world. 4.5 tons? Per person. Okay. Now, there are great disparities in this going around the world. In the United States, we are now emitting, you, me, everybody on average, about 17 tons per person. So every American on average is emitting 17 tons of uh, greenhouse gases every, every year. year. 17. Every year, 17 tons. Yeah. Now compare that with some, if you go somewhere in Europe, for example, Germany or United Kingdom, your numbers would be around nine and a half tons. Nine and a half. Okay. Quite low. In France, 
it's down to four and a half tons. And why is it so low in France? Well, it's largely because they are, most of their energy, a lot of their energy comes from nuclear power plants, yeah. and nuclear power plants don't feed this monster. Okay, the nuclear is clean. It's clean. Clean energy. Renewables yeah. are not necessarily clean. There. It depends on the practices. There's a lot more details that are needed in there. Okay. So say it again. How many tons of greenhouse gases am I emitting every year? About 18 tons a year. Okay. And uh, the United States vis-a-vis -vis China is, what are those? China numbers? is around nine these days. Nine tons. Per, per person. person. Global are, average is about four and a half. India is less than two tons per person. A lot of countries are, like Vietnam and all, 1.6 tons. Pakistan, 0.9 tons per person. So okay. that's, there's a huge disparity that's there in the world. Okay, so, and of course you agree, the bigger this monster gets, the more yeah. deadly it is to yeah. us. Yeah. Yeah. And have we reached a tipping point with respect to either the climate or with respect to the ocean, with respect to the concentration of this monster? Have we reached that tipping point where processes are now happening in this world that we cannot control? Um, it's a difficult question. I don't know the answer to that. Okay. I'm not sure about it. It feels that way to me from what I have looked at. I don't think there's much that we can do to change. To me, that is tipping point. Yeah. Whether it is or not, it kind of depends on how you are really looking at what a tipping point is. To me, it feels like, well, we are headed, we are baked into our system right now is that it's going to be a lot worse and we will be facing. And so the choices that we have to make are, let's not make it any worse. And whatever resources we have, let's try to mitigate the effects Okay, so paraphrasing you, there's already so much up there in the atmosphere and in the ocean, and you're not sure if it's too much for our health. But it's very bad already. Very bad. Very and bad. And there's nothing we can do with what's up there already. But what we have to do is make sure there's no more fumes, pollutions coming from the gas or any other sources, so this, this monster doesn't get any stronger and more threatening to us. I'll just say that you can't turn this off at the same time, all at once, because sure. I showed you the disparities and we need energy. Everybody needs energy to lead healthy, productive lives. So if I want to fo find alternate sources, I need to get clean sources that scale. Okay, I agree. We can't turn this off. We Immediately. Have to, we have to cook, we have to keep warm, we have to manufacture, we have to do a lot of things. Yeah. I want to thank you Rippu, and a cubic mile of oh, oil right. is like the Bible, and I encourage it for everyone. Thank you for Thank you very on. much. Now, uh, all right, Rippu helped us get a feel for this threatening monster. This thing is real, ladies and gentlemen. And I've sat down and talked to George Schultz, who is a former Secretary of State and a former everything in the United States government, practically. And I asked him, what would he recommend the next president to try to help make sure this monster doesn't become any more powerful? And I believe his number one suggestion that he is telling the next president, the next Congress, is Congress and the president need to get together and give us a carbon tax. And that would be a tax that would be like a wall, but nothing like Trump's wall. This would be a wall that would make it difficult for the coal industry, the gas industry, the oil industry to feed the monster. And it makes it difficult by putting a tax on fossil fuel, okay? And this is my symbolism of the wall for the tax and the money that's collected there eventually comes over here and comes out of the Department of Treasury and comes down over here. So what I want to do now is invite Jeb Eddy to come on here. Jeb is a man who 
has a good friend and helps me with uh, a lot of my projects, and I help him with some of his. And he's been staying close to an organization that is pushing, advocating for a carbon fee, a carbon tax, like I've articulated it here. And so he has some up-to-date information on, in particular, how the money, once the government gets the tax money, will distribute it. And also he's working very closely with uh, the Peace Corps trying to uh, get climate, citizen climate lobby and the Peace Corps working together. Thank you for being here. My pleasure. I am a, on the order of a year, new member of this nonprofit, nonpartisan organization called the Citizens Climate mm -hmm. Lobby. And I think they have 330 chapters nationwide focused on members of Congress to have us understand and start to move towards a fee that is returned as a dividend. There is not a slice taken off into Congress for special, special interests. So when Michael, when I first saw this wall, just a matter of a few weeks ago, I said, that's really cool. I, like, I just think it's terrific. Uh, there are, uh, there's quite a lot of agreement on the idea that uh, a, a fee tax could do a lot of useful things. There's less, less agreement on what to do with the money. Different groups want to spend it on their, on their own interests. But the Citizens Climate Lobby is specifically advocating for equal distribution, not slicing it off into various other things. So I'm also an ex-Peace Corps volunteer. And along with 220,000 others who have served in the Peace Corps, we are sensitive to prices. We have all lived in interesting circumstances where we're going shopping in the town market and we notice that the price of rice or vegetables or meat or something has gone up. Uh, I get to make a decision on how to spend my limited money. So I think this, this idea of a fee that would rise by $10 a ton every single year, so it's completely predictable, completely known to the, particularly the for-profit business community, they can start really thinking hard about how to cut down on their use of carbon so that they don't have to pay the fee. So I think it's a real interesting win. So now the money is collected when somebody goes to sell some coal, oil, or gas, and that money comes to the United States Treasury Department. Now, how does Citizen Climate Lobby want to distribute that money? Uh, the exact details, I don't think, are defined in the draft legislation. But one very uh, simple possibility is everybody with a Social Security card. No okay. questions about how long you've been here, how much money you've made. Everybody gets an equal slice. And that's a really interesting, simple, I think, uh, way that, that's something we can agree on. So I, okay. I think it's a heck of a good idea. Okay, so when I went, met with George Schultz, Secretary, the other day, um, he also said everybody who has a Social Security card will get the same amount of money. And then I raised the question about what about taking some of that money, some of that tax money, and maybe investing it extensively in research and development for the next generation of energy producing technology. And he said to me, no, no, I'm not for taking any of the money out of here, out of the tax. I want it all to be neutral from the fee. And I am for encouraging the next president, the next Congress in the normal budgeting process to come up with billions of dollars to help build the next generation of clean energy solutions. So I want to say thank you very much. Good fun. This, Jeb. Is, this is important work. Telling this story is good. really valuable. Thank you, good. Michael. Thank you very much. Also, in thinking about what would be good suggestions for the next president, the next Congress, with respect to a, an improved national energy policy, I'm, I also believe that Congress 
and the White House need to get together and put some muscle or some leg into squeezing as much energy out of, if we're going to use some coal, wind, solar, oil, whatever. In other words, what I'm saying, new legislation that, that requires that we are more energy efficient in everything, the planes, the cars, the trucks, the cement factories, everything must be more energy efficient. And so that leg indicates it's connected to Congress, it pushes down, out comes more money, out comes more energy. Now, a little while ago, I referred to advanced technology, technology that might take a, another 20 years that would allow us to make technology that gives us clean energy. Clean energy seems to be very, very important because if this monster is already dangerous, we don't want to give it any more fumes, even from gas, and, and even from some of these other sources. So I'm inviting Alex Canara, a friend of mine, Dr. Canara, Thank you. who has uh, been very kind to me and has helped me look out 20 years into what kind of technology we are developing right now that would give us safe, clean energy. And you helped me by explaining the technology for me to make this. What is that? Okay, well, Michael, this is a, an example of advanced energy generation from nuclear power. And this is a depiction of a kind of nuclear reactor that was developed in the 1960s by the inventor of the present type of reactor, which you represented up here with a life ring around it. And this is called the molten salt reactor. So rather than having a solid fuel of uranium that you exploit to generate heat, uh, this has a liquid salt which is pumped through the reactor. And the salt has several advantages, one of which is that it's very good thermal fluid. And so it can transfer the heat from whatever fission of uranium is occurring inside the reactor to another stage like a turbine that generates electricity by turning a generator. So this reactor was invented in order to simplify, make more efficient, and improve the ability to create a system that didn't require operator intervention if something went wrong. So you've depicted it here as this pot of salt, if it got too hot, the pipe would melt and it would all run down into this storage facility underground. In fact, the machines that were built in 1960s in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, uh, when they shut them down in December of 1969, uh, that's what happened. They just let the salt run out into a storage tank underground, and it's still there. So there was no danger to anyone. Uh, this is called something called walk away safe. The operators don't have to be present. If something goes wrong, the reactor shuts itself down automatically. So currently, reactor design using water, which makes steam, is fine, except that water only has a 100 degree centigrade range between solid and gas steam, whereas salt has a 1,000 degree centigrade range. So that's why you have a huge safety uh, limit. And you also have the ability, since it's a liquid, which is really important to chemists, to be able to extract from the salt at any time as it's running whatever it is that you want to extract. You might extract isotopes for medical purposes. You might extract an isotope that would hurt the reaction. All sorts of things can be done because it's a liquid and chemists love liquids. And that's really why this type of reactor was designed in the 60s. The Chinese are now taking our design and running with it. So by 2023, 25, we expect to see the Chinese building this type of prototype reactor. So we should certainly be funding it ourselves. That's uh, a given, I think, if we want to make some progress against the monster, because the monster is, is, is there. It's not going to go away. Is there anything? Yes, I'm just going to say a few things. So this is a cross-section of this 
reactor? Yes. And we're looking at the top, and that white is molten salt? Or? Sure. It, you right. you know, indicated this as, as white uh, for the salt. And you could think of yeah. this as this is the source of the power, the uranium, yeah. let's say, in the salt. And then the whole thing is a vat of liquid salt. And that's, okay. that's pretty good. And this is a dispenser that sort of moves back and forth, putting more of the thorium fluid in each of these. And here's one coming out. And here, it got too hot. It got a little dangerous. It melted the pipes. Everything collapsed into this. Oh, there's no dome to explode or whatever. And so... Right, so this is a non... There's no way in which you can make this device okay. have an explosion. And that's, that's the real benefit of using liquid salt in particular. All right. And uh, as I said, the thermal efficiency is great, and that's what we want to do. Alex, wonderful. Thank you, Thank you very Thank much. You. Now, whenever we talk about nuclear energy, uh, there's always the issue of waste. And I've invited uh, Dr. Bob Green. Pleasure, Michael. To come on and, uh, oh, we're creating something that's going to make a whole lot more nuclear waste? Uh, I want to step back a s for a second uh, and put us on a, a different foundation. Okay, and talk about waste for a second. Uh, we need to compare apples to apples. Okay, when you look at the fossil fuel waste, this is immense out here, and we never talk about it. Okay, and it's regularly, it's not really regulated as well either. As a matter of fact, you'll get more radiation coming out of coal than you will out of a nuclear plant. And I don't think people realize that. You mean all the nuclear plants we have in the United States is about 99. You it's take generating some radiation and some waste. No, no. Uh, no. no okay, no. they don't, if you go around the plant with a Geiger counter, you'll get practically zero. You go to a coal plant, you'll get an, uh, the Geiger counter will go crazy. So there's much more radiation right. in the coal industry, right. the coal and, processing. And here you've got methane coming out that is another greenhouse gas. Here you've got oil spills and uh, you know, other environmental disasters, and we never factor those into the equation. So if we were to look at this problem that this stuff creates, right. it's probably like that, but we don't know about it. Right. But it's but much we, less with nuclear. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, nuclear, its energy density is so much higher. So you could take about a marble size uh, piece of uranium, and that would be enough energy for your entire life. Whereas over here, uh, with coal, you need probably a uh, hundred, a hundred ton train cars uh, yeah. to come close to it. Wow. Okay. So. Uh, the quantities are far different to start with. And, and what that means here, in terms of the amount of waste that we have from the electrical I industry, and that's another distinction we have to make. When we talk about nuclear waste, we're really talking about the power industry. Um, you know, we shouldn't be thinking medical waste, we shouldn't be thinking of uh, the nuclear weapons industry, because that's really a separate industry. Compare apples to apples, please. Okay? Now, um, how much waste do we have here? Okay, what come, they have to replace the fuel rods uh, because uh, they expand and crack, and if they don't take them out early, then uh, they got bigger problems. So th we only use maybe 5% of a fuel rod, uh, often less. Okay, so most of what comes out of there is 95% potential fuel. Okay, and we're wasting that. So one of the things we want to do is take advantage of that. Now, this type of reactor can be designed to burn down that sort of waste. Now, how much waste is this? It's a lot less than people think. If you took all the nuclear waste that was generated from the beginning of the industry, uh, you know, 50, 60 years, that's 70,000 tons, metric tons, that we have existing today. Uh, if you piled it up on a football field, it would run from end zone to end zone nine feet high. That's all it is, but you can't store it that way. So just let me go over that again. If you took all the nuclear waste just from that that was generated in the process of creating energy, and you had one football field, you could pile it all up nine feet. 
Right. Okay. Yeah, a little more than nine feet. Yeah. But if I included the building bombs, uh, then the, then we have uh, it's a whole new. It's a whole uh, different industry. Uh, okay. Okay. So most people think of the nuclear waste as right. being included, but just so when you're thinking energy, energy, you should think energy. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, so what does this do? What can we do if we go to this sort of scenario? As, as uh, Alex pointed out, this circulates. Yes. And because it circulates, you can get a much better use, usage of the material. You can burn 100% of the material uh, in this scenario. Okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to reduce the quantity immensely, okay? And then oh. secondly, um, you still are going to have waste. You're going to have byproducts, uh, some of which can be used for medical applications and others, but they're m much more b benign. 83% of them are benign in 10 years. Uh, the others are on the order of three to 400 years, the other 17%. Versus what we have coming out with our current designs, uh, where we have to sequester some of the stuff for hundreds of thousands of years. So this is a huge win to go in this direction. Okay. Well, you have pretty much convinced me. <laughs> and, okay. uh, and so, Bob, I well, want to... Can you sign the order now? <laughs> Bob, I want to say thank you okay. very much. And thank you, Michael. And oh, just stay okay. for a minute. And I just want to explain what this is up here. You know, there's about 99 plants nuclear plants, and they are producing clean energy. They are not contributing to the monster. And because they're not contributing to the monster and they are giving us energy, um, it's going to be recommended to the next president. We throw a lifesaver. We don't let states and other organizations shut down these plants because they are giving us the energy we are need and they are not so, I'm Michael Killen. I want to thank Bob Green, Alex Canara, Rapu Malhotra. Chip, uh, say. Mal Rapu Malhotra. Malho that's what I was going to okay. say. And Jeb Eddy. Yeah, and I'm Michael Killen, and uh, I hope this has been informative for you. And I thank everybody for helping here. Okay? You were very good.